So, as promised, we start at five minutes after two, sharp. As Holger is from Germany and I'm from Germany. <laughs> so, welcome everyone for the next uh, talk here. Our next speaker in the FSFE's track is Holger Nefsen. Holger is a DBN user since the mid-1990s. From the early 2000s on, he was starting uh, to get involved in Debian. And now for almost 10 years, he's working on the reproducible builds, which is a topic that is getting more and more important around us and why and uh, what he's working on there for the world for you yourself. Over to you, Holger. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. So I talk about the reproducible builds the first 10 years. And this talk is really work in progress, but I felt it was necessary to document the history. Like I've been giving many talks about what reproducible builds are, why are they useful here, I try to have some more history, and it's an early beta of the talk. Um, who is he made? And it's also not about 10 years with Rousseau Bills, it's more about my 10, first 10 years with Rousseau Bills, from a perspective of it. Though it's not my work, but with Rousseau Bills, like the software in general, is collective effort. And um, the idea is also older than 10 years. Like so these are some people, I think it's 160 people, who contributed um, to Rousseau Bills or Git repositories. Or otherwise, if you are missing there and read that, please come to me later and I will add you there. It's the work of many people. So, as Matthias explained, I'm Holger, I'm located in Hamburg. I'm using Debian since a long time. Um, I love Debian, most of my work is on Debian, but in Oracle's Builds, I also love free software in general. Um, I don't really care what project with this as long as it's um, free software. Um, ask me anything, anytime, after the talk, during the talk, I'm fine to be interrupted. I'm happy to talk about the rules of this. Um, so about you. Who knows about the rules of this? How? Why? Uh, more than half the audience, I would say. That's great. Uh, who has contributed to reproducible bits? You, thank you. Um, who knows that reproducible bits have been known for more than 10 years? Oh, quite some. And more than 30 years. Okay, that's so. Who knows about s -Bomb? Ah, some. So that's software bill of materials, and we call it build info files in 2014. And then the software bill of materials is like the ingredients of a tomato soup, and SBOM is the ingredients of software, came up in 2021. But that's a bit, oh, that's there as well. Anyhow. So reproducible builds. Introduction, the problem, source code. Of, of, of free software is available, that's pretty nice. But most people install binaries. And the problem is no one really knows whether they really correspond. Because somebody gives you a binary and says that's coming from there. And as a result, there are various classes of supply chain attacks. That's pretty bad. Our solution there is to enable anyone to independently <coughs> verify that a given source produces bit by bit identical results. Um, so, reproducible builds are an important building block to make supply chains more secure. Nothing more, nothing less. There's still other ways to take the supply chain. There's, you can put backdoors in software. So, reproducible builds only tackle one bit of the supply chain. And as a side effect, you can only be sure a binary is free software if it has been reproduced. Because then you know this source code comes, this binary comes from the source code. And then you can certainly say someone else's binary is free software because it comes from the source. And I'm going very quickly to there here now. 
when is the build reproducible? This is our definition from the website. Build is reproducible if given the same source code, build environment, and build instructions. Any part can be created by build identical copies of all specified R artifacts. We have written this down, so this is our definition of reproducible. Also, because sometimes reproducible has been used in the meaning of repeatable, and when we mean reproducible, we mean this. And this is all the definition of what the build environment is, what the build instructions are. Um, I skip this here. This is written down there, you can read it and use it. And by now, this has been widely and largely understood. And so we have on our website, we have these sources, which are um, talks, talks we've been, been given. Docs are documentation for some aspect like build passes or other variations. And publications are academic publications. There's like 10 on the our website. Um, if you would see that and something missing, please add patches. And also another thing where it's understood is this White House briefing statement from 2021, which was general cyberspace, security, supply chain, large and long document and on the advanced measures on page 42 there's reproducible builds. Um, and that from this um, statement also comes the SBAM requirement that the US government in the future will only buy software which has an SBAM. So, and now I'd like to show a presentation from 2013. Uh, this one. <coughs> Yeah, I want to believe. Somebody said so. This is really not good for trust. And I know the binary because I compiled it myself. It runs on my machine. I'm a responsible person. Why should I worry? And we think of software development as a fundamentally billion activity. I'm not that interested. Why would you hack me? But people developers are hacked because of their users. If you would ever develop the, the Twitter client, there's 8 million people and half the world on it. That's your really good attack vector. Um, and this has been described in, earlier, there's been known attacks which are listed in older talks. That's why I mentioned these older talks. And I just want to show this talk because there's one great example in there. Yeah. The most secure computer of the world. Is it networked? Does it physical access? Arbitrary USB devices. Um, several nation states want to access it. But what does the computer? Hundred of million computers, every bank account in the world, every Windows computer. And how much money can you throw at attacking this computer or your computer or the projects built for us? Um, and the difference really, this was a SSH um, remote root. The, the diff is one character, greater or greater equals. That's the diff in the source code. This is the binary code. I don't really see, uh, the diff is, this is the diff, but in assembler. And in binary, it's a single bit. This bit is different. It gives you remote root. <laughs> and then I think it was not that the eye is dressing that shirt. He created a kernel module that <coughs> I just the code the compiler um, sees versus the code you see when you look at it with an editor. Um, so there's lots of thin and so reproducible is there's there a solution. Um, I'm not going to go into details here today, I want to explain the history, so this was 2013. So reproducible builds, I, I skip sometimes back and forth. In 2023, like in 12 days, 30 days ago, there was this nice mail on the WireGuard mailing list that WireGuard, the VPN client for Android, um, is now reproducible and they, they release the same on their website, on F-Droid and on the Google App Store. <coughs> and in fact, the F-Droid release is only done if they can reproduce the build identity. 
And that is pretty, pretty cool. And what was also cool is that they didn't inform us. They just released it on their mailing list. People just do reproduce the books now, which was yay. Like, I was really, really happy with this so much. Um, so how did we get there? Edward Snow and money. In fact. Why money? Bitcoin. The Bitcoin people were the first in the recent times who made their client reproducible because they were afraid that somebody would uh, publish a backdoor Bitcoin client, steal all your Bitcoin, and then blame it on them. So they developed Gideon, which was a bit, which was a build system. They've now abandoned it um, to create a reproducible Bitcoin client in 2011. Um, so in 2011, Bitcoin was reproducible and was the first software route. And then Snowden happened in 2013, and people thought more about this. And then Mike Perry made the Tor browser reproducible in 2013 because he thought about it, what the various attacks of state actors and how to prevent this. And Tor Bowser is Firefox, one of the biggest software in the world. But like the big Bitcoin client is very small, but Firefox the binary is 70 megabytes or something. And he made it that every bit of the 70 megabyte was identical. Um, and that triggered Luna's off at that point 13, where he brainstorm how to make Debian reproducible. Debcom was the Debian conference, and Debcom 13 was in 2013. And that, that started the whole thing in the modern times, more or less. But there were earlier works. Um, there was this mail on 2017, this, where somebody asked, Building packages three times in a row. Um, and the results were <coughs> not so good. There was Neil Williams said, I see no benefit. I see no benefit in Google. This was 2017. Manoj is also, he sees no benefit, but he also says that it's infeasible. Um, Technically infeasible, but hey, I'm happy to be proven wrong. People thought this was impossible. That was 2017. Um, and then in 2007, we learned from John Gilmore, who was one of the GCC developers in the 90s, that GCC was reproducible on eight architectures in the 90s. GCC wasn't reproducible in 2017 anymore. It got lost over time. Um, so people had done that. And I also hear rumors in 2015 that slot machines were required to be reproducible due to um, value added tax fraud. And I was puzzled because those machines had whatever, four key kilobytes of memories. And some people knew every bit, so the, the culture was there in the whatever, 70s, 80s, or 90s. But as computer become, became more powerful and bigger, people lost that, because they were busy handling all this infrastructure and the ecosystem. Um, and 10 years ago, with machines, even bigger was unimaginable. Um, so on a small detour, what I learned 2022, there's actually a company now doing this. What I heard as a rumor before, they do certification for gaming machines, um, mostly partly using Diffoscope, which is our tool, which I explain in a second. But they, so they analyze software to stay to the state. This is predictable gaming machines. Um, also, recent surveys are used for license compliance. What I explained. Can only be sure a binary history software that can be rebuilt reproducibly. And it's also nice for software development. Does this change really have no effect or the desired effect only? If you can analyze the diff um, thoroughly, like Diffoscope does, then you can do this. So, Diffoscope. Who knows about Diffoscope? 
Ooh, we let us not many. Three people are experienced. Who uses diffoscope on a few three? One person, yay. So diffoscope. Um, Diffoscope does in-depth comparison of files archived on directories. Diffoscope tries to get to the bottom of what makes a file. It will recursively unpack archives of many kinds. So it has a whatever you give it a Debian package. Inside the Debian package there's a tar archive. In the tar archive is a PDF. In the PDF is an image, and the image is varied by the timestamp. The Diffoscope will show the timestamp of the varied image. Um, so. This is an example where you can hardly see it, it shows the differences there. Um, um, and Diffoscope it was originally started for Debian archive files, but now you can diff give Diffoscope any of these file types. Whatever, give it two same objects, two ISO files, two Word documents, two anything. Diffoscope will compare them. Um, and you can install Diffoscope via apt install or with Docker or with DNF or whatever, it's available on ESD. I think the only missing bit is a Windows port, it's written in Python. It's available on, on NixOS, Homebrew, so you can run it on Mac. Um, Diffoscope is really cool. And if you just want to try it, there's Try Diffoscope, the web page where you can just upload two things and it will do run Diffoscope for you. Because if you install Diffoscope on a normal system, it will install two gigabytes of recommends because it supports all these file types. So if you just want to try it, use the web page. So back to 2013 again. Luna made this buff and made another buff at that point 14 the next year. And there were some patches developed, mostly Luna and BDM, the, the package maintainer, first for sorting the contents of the inside of the Debian packages, which made them unreproducible, and also the build info files were created. The idea of build info files is to record the environment so that then later for rebuilds you can use this build info file to recreate the environment and then redo the build. That is the build instructions um, rebuild. And then in September 2014, I started systematic builds of Debian packages twice and compared them. First, I only did really did a for loop for one whatever package names, and then I just did all of them, all 30,000. Um, and Mike Perry and Seth Schoen gave this talk at the CCC Congress, of where I showed the slides in the beginning, and they showed my graphs. I was like, wow. And this was the graph. <laughs> There yeah, I start on the left is uh, October 2014, on the right is 2015 because it's from the Foster talk. Um, and the green packages are reproducible ones, the orange ones are unreproducible ones, and the red failing to build. So there it was already in the beginning, mid 2014, it was 60%, and then we um, fixed something in the tool chains and got to 70 or 80%. That was pretty impressive. And this is the graph, how it looks now. And if you see up until here, here is what we saw in the previous slide. So this is eight years of graphs. And we got there a bit, but also Debian grows and grows and grows. There's more software in Debian. So we like, it's not that impressive. Really. I'll get to that in a bit. 2015, Luna and myself gave a talk, and Fostam, as you know, is a big conference where many people from many, many projects come, and we were introduced and invited the Free Software World at large to collaborate with us, to not only have the Debian effort, but also have RPM involved, have Arch Linux involved, and that triggered many things. And also at the CCC camp, Luna gave a presentation showing many problems and their solutions. So if you want to have some problems, look at these old things that were good, well described there. And in September 2015, we developed the source date epoch specification, um, 
which I played in a second. And we had the first big Build Summit in Athens, where I think 25 people from 20 projects were there to work together on this. So, the summits, we had six summits since then. Um, and we'll have another one this year in Hamburg. So if you're interested in reboots of this, you're very much invited to come. Um, and it's like we usually have three days where we work together, discuss things, do plans. We don't do much hacking there. We rather try to discuss the problems and find solutions. Um, and there were, in the, in the six previous summits, there were people from 50 projects there. And there are some which are not listed there because they didn't want to be named, but there were more than 60 projects. And as you can see, there's whatever, Huawei was there, several universities, some BSDs, some projects you never heard of. Um, it's a nice mix and very interesting. And one result of the Revolutionary Build Summit was also bootstrappable org, which is the effort to bootstrap the compiler chain from the from a very small binary seed. Because the way software development is done now, you use the previous compiler to build the current compiler and you cannot bootstrap it anymore. And bootstrapable org was the result of the, the build summit. And can, so now you can um, bootstrap GCC from a 420 byte seed, which is like also something which got lost over the years. Um, I didn't mention source that epoch yet. I mentioned source that epoch now. So the reasons for unreproducibility we found is mostly timestamps. It's 70%, it's timestamps, 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 timestamps in documentation, timestamps in the binary, timestamps on web, and the build passes, and then all the rest. The rest is hashes not sorted deterministically, Hashes which saw different in different locales. But the biggest percentage is really time, time steps. Um, and for time steps, we developed source state epoch. Who knows about source state epoch? A few. So build time steps are meaningless, in our opinion, and source state epoch is describes the modification the last modification of the source. Because whether you build the software today or tomorrow shouldn't matter. What might matter is the last modification of the source. And that's supported by a lot of software today. Um, so there's whatever BusyBox does support, DocBook, several doc tools, GCC does support it. Because um, there's many um, documentation tools in there, because projects build their documentation and then they embed the type step of the build time. And now we make them make patches that if source date epoch is set, they will use that variable instead. And there's 70, I think, projects supported. So if, if, if it's set, the software will be slightly different and will be reproducible. Um, yeah, and for the build pass variation, the solution is rather simple, but it took me 10 years to get there. First, we tried to fix that, and we still do it, that the build pass should not be embedded, so we should make patches to whatever I remember, the Rust compiler, the Rust compiler builds the build pass, and often you can drop it, it's useful for debugging, because the debugging symbol is again the build pass, but you can do a, um, prefix the build pass with a known pass, and then migrate this. Um, and for Debian, we came up with a workaround, we record the build pass in the build info file, and do rebuilds in the same pass. Because Debian does builds in random parts, and several projects do that. But actually, it's way better to use a predictable pass. Just use whatever build pass name, software name, version number. Always use this, and with namespaces, you can have concurrent builds of this, which was blocking. But just use predictable build passes. Because then, if the build pass is embedded in the, um, in the build artifact, 
it doesn't matter because it's predictable. So if somebody does a rebuild, it will be the same parts of it. And this is the difference between embedding the build pass, this is with random build passes, and this is with predictable build passes. So we get a, the difference is 85 to 95 percentage roughly of reproducible packages in that loop. Um, yeah. And this is somehow where the history part ends, because also the Doc's history page on our webpage ends there in 2015. Because in 2015 the development accelerated even further of reproducible builds, so we forgot to write the history. So Arch Linux has done a lot. Um, there's rebuilders now, um, and Pac-Man did so. <coughs> to go through this, what we've done before by I mentioned rebuilders is we have done CI builds where we just build random, but we don't compare what Debian actually distributes. Um, and Arch Linux does it better now for Debian, we are getting there. Pac-Man bin chunks is binary transparency, like certificate transparency, where the SSL certificates are stored, so if a different certificate is uh, published, it will be detected, and with binary transparency, the idea is to lock all the binaries, so even if you install an unreproducible binary, you can be sure that you install the unreproducible binary that everyone else has installed. Um, and also Fedora, I'm not sure whether it was this year or last year, they enabled some macro that RPMs will, will build will also be reproducible. They're not doing more yet, but it's still great that after eight years they finally enabled this macro. So current RPM packages from Fedora, not from Red Hat, <laughs> um, from REL, um, should be more reproducible. And s bombs, as I said, um, we've done s bombs or build info files for a long time, but the s bomb files currently discussed in the industry just describe what the vendor says. We use the software with verified s bombs, verified in the sense that this s bomb can be used to create bit by bit identical result. You have a verified s bomb that you know this s bomb really describes reality and not what the vendor says. Um, yeah, so if, and I would like to get see some help writing this history because it's not a good thing if the people doing the history writing the history. Also, I would rather work on the code and not document it. Um, so thank you. That was the talk, more or less. So, it's not the, the, the end of the talk, I have more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want more, or was it too much? More. <laughs> <laughs> we want more. Um, the following slides haven't been updated since September 22, so they are half a year old, which is not so bad. Um, yeah. So other project, Tails, is reproducible since, I forgot, 2018 or 19. Tails is a um, Debian live system which uses Tor by default, um, which was also famously known for Snowden has used it, so they, the, the developers were also afraid that they are a very good target, and the Tails developers are now very, and they, Tails releases are now only done if the build process creates one reproducible ISO. If that doesn't happen, then Tails will not be released. And the nice thing for the developers is they don't fear them being attacked anymore because everybody else can recreate the same thing. And I wrote Tails easy there because Tails is just one ISO. The problem with Debian or Fedora or whatever, 30,000 packages, you need to come have 30,000 packages and have 30,000 hashes and rebuilds and all this stuff. And we have scaling problems there still because we're still in this research, research thing. For Tails, they have one ISO, you create one hash, you can compare it, and it's either reproducible or not. Um, Arch Linux has rebuilders, as I said. We'll not get further. 
And then, so Arch is also 86% reproducible. The core repository is more than the community. Arch is doing pretty good there. And Zuse also has active development by one person, but it's not enabled in the official builds. So Zuse is also still in this research phase, like most of us are. Kales is not. Um, VixOS used to have this web page, r30y.com, which is reproducibility. They have now a new URL, which is reproducible.xos or something. Um, which um, Geeks is also reproducible by design. There's a tool called Geeks Challenge, which you can call, which will build a package and then compare the hashes. Um, and Yocto supports reproducible images. So Yocto is an image builder for embedded systems, and so you can get reproducible images for that time. And Asteroid um, also does support reproducible builds. They have also done recently more since September. So they have now whatever Asteroid has 600 packages or something, and 50 or 100 of them are reproducible now, and they only get published if they are reproducible. Which is cool, but also showed a problem um, with the German Corona tracing app. There was a new release, and the new release was not reproducible anymore. So it was not published on Asteroid. And why this is cool, this is generally a question. You have software which is reproducible, then it gets a security fix, and the software is not reproducible anymore. Do you want to still deploy, roll out the security fix, or not? And we need to think about these problems once we, once we solve the reproducibility issues. Um, Alpine has basic support, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, also ElectroBSD. The, the BSD based system is reproducible, and the port system, which is like the package system for Linux, has basically the same issues. So there's software which is unreproducible and software which is not. Fedora and Ubuntu, not interested it seems. Fedora has now enabled the macro, so Fedora is a bit more interested. Um, oh, um, and yeah, many projects support reproducible builds, but it's unclear what it means, how it's enforced, and how users can know and be confident. Um, because basically, the UI we want is that there is no UI, that you can only install reproducible software. But Debian is at 96%, and that still means that there's 800 out of 30,000 packages which are not reproducible. And on my machine, there's probably 20 or 30 unreproducible packages which I need. So it's not feasible to say only install reproducible software. And we don't want to have a UI which says, Oh, this software is not reproducible. Do you still want to install it? People will hit yes, ignore, 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 and no. Um, yeah, this is what I said. So, what is also nice is um, I probably didn't backdoor this. It's something KPC YRD wrote. It's a manual, basically. It's a simple hello world in Rust, reproducing the ELF binary, reproducing the Docker images, reproducing the Arch Linux package. And he wants to show there that he has not backdoored it and that you can um, follow his thoughts and his code. I, I recommend to look at this. And the other thing is from um, Bernard Wiedemann, the unreproducible package which is a package which has many mistakes which make the software unreproducible. So there's timestamps in there, it has hashes in there which are sorted randomly and whatnot. And it's a good documentation how not to do it because it's easier to say, you can easily say something is unreproducible, but you can not really say what do I need to do to make a software reproducible. You can only say the mistakes, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. And this is the attempt to do this. Um, yeah, this, 
try to document everything on this URL. So there we go. Um, yeah, I've discussed this already. As I said, these are old slides. Um, I skipped this a bit because I had this. This was a nice talk we gave. There's four people there on stage. And giving a talk with four people on stage is quite nice. <laughs> um, and this was the buff where people discussed how to do it. So this is talks I have given at DevConf about reproducible this. And um, I feel I've given warning the next Debian release will not re be reproducible for years. That was from my last DevConf talk. But actually that quote was from the year before, because I've said this for many years, and the next Debian release will not be reproducible and the one after also. Uh, I get there. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm frustrated and happy about this. Happy about the progress, but frustrated because it's still not reproducible. <laughs> um, so, Stretch was the release, whatever, six years ago, eight years, eight years ago. There were in theory, the package had the first packages, but not in practice. Basta, we were not, and pulls out, I've, we've realized there were 3,000 build info files missing, so it's still not there. Uh, Bookworm is the release coming up next month, or in June, or whatever it will come. Um, it will be more reproducible, but it will not still be fully reproducible. Um, so let's play. Oh yeah, and the release after book one will be tricky. <laughs> and, um, I get this. So yes, 93 or nowadays 95 reproducibility is a lie. Or rather, those are CI conti continuous integration results. Um, this is the graph. Uh, these are bugs. These are I don't know why this. This is bugs we filed with patches for unreproducible software. So the graph is at what? 20,000. So we filed 20,000 bugs about reproducibility issues. Though this is the real graph, because most of them were software failing to build from source. So this is 3,500 patches for reproducibility issues. And the green ones are merged ones, and the red are not merged. So 3,000 patches from us were accepted. Um, so we made progress. We made progress. Each release get a bit, a bit bigger number. And there's always each Debian release has lots of more, like 10% more software. So we made a lot of software reproducible in each release. Um, I'll spare you the details. Too much information. Um, so, <coughs> we have no Debian infrastructure for rebuilding Debian packages yet. We do only CI builds where we build a software twice, but we don't compare, and we do this twice to, to maximum variation to find causes for unreproducibility. But we don't compare what Debian releases. That's why I call it a lie, because we have two main blockers for rebuilders. Actually, we have still one. There are some packages which are without build info files, just 3,000 of them. So I added 3,000 source uploads last year or something, with no changes just to trigger a rebuild to get these build info files created. And snapshot Debian org um, was unusable. Because the way we do rebuilds is we record the build environment in this build info file slash sbomb file and then we um, take the source code and build it again. But the build info files describe the Debian archive on a specific day in the past. So um, there's snapshot Debian org which has all Debian of the last 15 years every day how unstable it was on any given day. And that's whatever 60 terabyte of data or something. The problem with snapshot Debian org is that it doesn't scale. You can download single packages from there, but if you want to download 30,000 different timestamps from different days, it doesn't scale. So Frederick Perrier wrote a 
replacement, which is only AMD64, and with that we can now rebuild Debian AMD64. But we cannot rebuild the other architectures. Um, yeah, I had this already. Um, so this is this is actually real world rebuilds of Debian, and there's Debian at 81%, but this is compared to what Debian actually distributes, <coughs> which is still pretty good. And ah, no, that's good. Yeah. But in the build essential package set, there's Linux, GCC, and nowadays also glibc, which are unreproducible. And so you cannot even have you cannot have a build essential set without these packages. You can have the, the, the essential or the required set of Debian is 100% reproducible, but that is 20 source or 23 source packages, and so not really enough. So we cannot still not have a fully reproducible Debian packages, but. We might get there this year, this is being tickled now. <coughs> um, I have this. I just like this. I'm skipping this because I feel this is too much. Um, is this also? Yes. This is what I just said. <laughs> but. Um, that they can install the images are also not reproducible. <clears throat> but Debian live images, we can create. There we are. Debian live system, and those are reproducible now for the upcoming bookworm release. Debian live is basically like Tails. We take some Debian packages which might be reproducible or not and reproducibly rebuild them into an image. So everybody gets the same image, and for, now we have this for Debian images as well, which is great, and which is progress on the way there. Um, and similar also there's, back to this, live images, there's also Docker images. Debian Docker images are also reproducible. Because the Docker images don't contain a Linux kernel. Um, so that we get there step by step, and I hope eventually we have a fully release. Because, <laughs> you know, this is for the Debian, Debian, the release process you upload to Unstable, and then the package migrates to testing. And now, if a package is unreproducible, it will migrate slower. So there's an incentive now to make packages reproducible. We like that. Um, and also since 2017, in Debian policy, there's now a paragraph saying packages shall be reproducible. It's not must yet. Because the release team, then, <coughs> if it would be must, there would be 800 packages which need to be picked out. So it's too early for must, but maybe for the upcoming release, you can have must not regress. So if the package is reproducible now, it's not allowed anymore to become unreproducible. Um, so Bookworm is now almost, it's definitely frozen, and as I said, Bookworm will be released in May or in June. And there are zero packages without build info file, so this is cool. And build essentially reproducible, we don't manage it, the DI images. Yeah, we need to address the snapshot issue still. I hope that maybe, like, Bookworm will be released this year, Trixie will be released in 2025. So in Forky is the name after Trixie, in 2027, <laughs> so in four years from now, I hope we, Debian, can say every package which is unreproducible will not be part of the stable release. Um, I'm not sure if it's feasible or it will be 2029, but I would like it to be 2020 something, not 2023. <laughs> um, thank you. How am I? So now we have time for questions. Okay, here we are. Um, if you go way back to that 
graph with the packages, there was a big dip in, in reproducibility that quickly recovered afterwards. Do you know what happened there? I think it was some issue with the build system. With the build infrastructure was a glimpse of the statistics. <laughs> it was not real in the software. I want to comment as a side effect of what you are doing with the path, uh, with the build paths, that you are fucking with a lot of testers like me. We can no longer use the build paths to find developer names and stuff like that. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> One interesting thing we also do is we, build, we have systems running in the future. So I have computers running in 2024. And that also finds interesting bugs. There's not many people doing this, so it's fun to find these bugs. If, like software which doesn't live on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> it exists. Um, so what you now showed was like the the late end of the reproducing or of the security story, I would say. Um, but you also showed us how small the, the difference, even in code, between secure and non-secure can be, right? Um, so is there any idea for how to connect all the work done in reproducible builds to revenue results so that we can not just know somebody else replicated that, but also somebody actually signed off on this specific part of software? Mm, I don't think so. I think what, what I... Also, what one conclusion of this one bit difference was um, that we want the whole complete build results to be identical, even including documentation, including helper tools, including anything, because bugs can be anywhere. And if you have um, a tool which says, "Okay, this release is reproducible, just ignore those bits," then this tool which will ignore those bits can have bugs. And this is exactly what happened with Signal, when Signal in 2015 or 16 made a release. Signal is now reproducible, but there's these blocks in there which are monoid specific and we need to ignore them. So here we have a tool which will do this, and then two days later the exploit was found with this tool. So that's why we say always compare the full hash and just compare the hash. With different scope to find out why something is not reproducible but to, find, to test whether something is reproducible, just compare the hashes. Because the hash function is reasonably safe, and if the hash function is broken, we are doing <laughs> anyway, so just compare everything. I found it interesting that you didn't mention Android at all. Is it so far from being reproducible? Pardon? Android. Oh, I only mentioned Android applications. Yeah, but the AOSP itself? I have no idea about Android itself, actually. But like that. Um, some, somebody needs to... If you build Android regularly, build it twice and run different scope on the results. Then I would... Uh, I would ask one question. So, uh, I mean, that's a lot of work you have done for 10 years and others in your team. Uh, who is uh, enabling you to do this? Who is financing this all the years? Well, there's, there's several answers to it. So there's a few people, um, four people are working specifically on this and originally uh, Luna and myself are funded by the Core Infrastructure Initiative, Initiative from the Leeds Foundation but that ran out in 2017 or something. 17 years. 18. And since 2018, um, we are now funded by Software Freedom Conservancy. And this works, we, we um, find sponsors, and we are an SFC project, so we give the money to SFC and SFC pays us. But there's really, as you saw, there's 150 people at least on this list working on it, and so people are working on many Areas and update them. And thanks to the sponsors. I omitted many things in this talk.
Any other questions? Or do you also already uh, look at how? Yeah. Good. Um, <coughs> I'm thinking from the traceability point of view for this um, reproducible. Um, many, many years ago, when I work with the CMEs, uh, in the end of the release, you're always required to have all of your source code, your configure files, your prerequisites to store them in your place, released together with your products. At the same time, it's very difficult to have this reproducible environment in place, even though your source code is there. But after several years, when we have this uh, uh, virtual machine um, technique, and then you always can have this image <coughs> to export that and save it in your environment, which is better. And now the docking image, etc., is reproducing become more and more easier. Uh, but the use case, what I'm thinking is for the real use case. Let's say I released a product 10 years ago. Okay, now in the market there are some problem. I need to <coughs> get it where the source code is, etc., where it's. But the use case is I need to fix it. I don't need to reproduce the exactly the version of when I released it, right? So, 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 uh, when you have everything there, you probably do some kind of debug or add some feature and fix it. Then you compile together. But when you compile it, you probably have a lot of the dependency of libraries in your source code. It's very difficult to get exactly the same as previous one because then we download it from the internet directly with the new version. This, this is what I, or we have been addressed with the snapshot thing, that we recreate the exact same environment, because then we know this will work. Because a minor version change of GCC or some library might result in different results. And while it still be pos might be possible to recreate the same environment, uh, the same results with a slightly different web environment, we know with the exact same environment, we can recreate it. So at the moment, our effort is to recreate the exact same environment, because we, then we can be sure or surer to be able to recreate this. But in practice, it should also be possible with other we just don't know. So the simpler approach is to recreate the same environment. But in the Debian case, the problem is these 30,000 packages in Debian were created using 30,000 different environments. So we need to recreate 30,000 different environments, which does work but has scaling issues. So it's much nicer. There's other projects like Ubuntu. In Ubuntu release, <coughs> the week before the release, everything is rebuilt with the same thing. So recreating this is simple. But changing the Debian environment build process there is hard. So we just made it there. For OpenWRT, for example, OpenWRT has a list of 11 or something tools which are needed to build OpenWRC, uh, OpenWRT, and recreating this environment should be easy. But it's, there's also there's probably also research needed to say, okay, you can use this if it says whatever GCC 13.2.1. It's also okay if you use GCC 13.2.2. For these projects, for our, others not. So we are we found a way of we recommend to recreate the exact same environment even in ten years, because then we know it might work. There's still then issues that when we rebuild in ten years, that certificates will have expired or something. Yeah? That's why we build in the future, and we only build uh, a year and a month in advance. And it might be that software will fail to build in 10 years for whatever reason. There's the test whether the current year starts with 202. And in 10 years, the current year will start with 203. So the software will fail to build. So there's still lots of things to be done with research. It's like I said, 2007, which is 16 years ago, which is not that far ago, people said this was impossible. And we've shown that it's possible. So what is need to be done is how is it possible to make this easy? This is certainly not the end. There's a lot of technical debt. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, then thank you very much for all of you attending and taking part in the discussion. Thank you very much, Olga.